let's talk about that really quick. So the two eclipses and what those represent. Well, I think the two eclipses bracket a time of preparation that we have been allowed to have. And that if you think back on from about 2017 with until virtually 2020, but even then you think about it, we have still had much prosperity. I mean, it's starting to diminish quickly now. We're seeing it making that transition again away from that, but we still have had a good time to prepare. I know for a good lot of my associates that I used to be in the construction industry, they've had the best years ever. Um, you know, we've had a time of great prosperity, actually, prior to what's coming. So I believe my personal interpretation has always been that this is our time of preparation. Had the opportunity given to us to prepare. And the window is closing quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first the first eclipse um, being the one that happened in August of 2017 that created a cross-section of the United States. And uh, it was really cool because we're in Idaho. And so we were in the path of total eclipse. And it was, wow, such a unique experience to be outside in the middle of the day and the sun just turns off and you start hearing crickets because they think that it's twilight, like just such a, such a remarkable experience. And then this is going to, as you said, be bracketed on the other side by a second eclipse. For those of you who don't know, that's predicted, I believe, April of 2024. Am I right? April 8th. April 8th. April 8th of 2024, which will create a cross section of the United States in the opposite direction. And if you were to overlay the two eclipses and see where they meet, it's directly over Independence, Missouri. Correct? Actually, that's not quite correct. Where it really. Okay, fix it. <laughs> Illinois is where the cross event is, and it's right where Laconius made his last stand, and it's right over the New Madrid Fault. But the really cool thing about the two eclipses is the path of both of them. Okay, um, we actually were in far west with a whole big tour of people um, for the first eclipse, mm. and it went right over far west Missouri, and it was beautiful. The path of it led it right over Independence and all of those church history sites, and then it went off out by Myrtle Beach. But this one comes up from Mexico comes up through and this one goes out over Palmyra and over that area. So it mm. actually is kind of encompassing all of our church history sites to a large degree. But the biggest thing is the crossover is that the new Madrid, which is responsible for the three days of darkness at the time of Christ, um, the new Madrid fault or earthquake that went off is actually what gave the time of darkness at the time of Christ, which is really cool when you get into that whole history mm. and understand that. It's pretty awesome. But point being is these two eclipses bracket a time of the final warning being completed, in my perspective, on April 8, 2024. And then I think we're going to see things progress really rapidly. And there's so many pointers of that. Yeah. And the beginning of April is interesting because there's some appointed times around there. Am I right? Absolutely. That's Passover. Uh, the selection of the lamb, Passover, and first fruits there too. So yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's also interesting to note that according to Hebrew tradition and the rabbis, that when you have a solar eclipse, that is a warning to the nations, to the Gentiles. Whereas lunar eclipses our warnings to Israel because they have a lunar calendar and we have a solar calendar. And so it's a, it's not only, you know, an X over America, but it, you know, it's an X over, a, it's a Gentile sign for a Gentile nation. Right. We are the Gentiles. The, this is something that I've mentioned on the show a couple of times, but uh, for the sake of clarity, it's super important to understand is that from a scriptural perspective, our scriptures were written by members of the house of Israel, Hebrews, and we, the Latter-day Covenant people, are the Gentiles. So 
whenever they talk about the Gentiles, they're talking about us. Yeah, really important to to understand that. It uses the words we are identified with the Gentiles, which kind of gives us a plausible that we can we are kind of Israel, but we're a half baked cake. That's all Hosea, meaning we haven't come under covenant yet at the full level that we're going to. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say is if you go to the scriptures and actually study the topic of the Gentiles and when do you become a member of the house of Israel, right? Because we are given that opportunity when you're quote unquote adopted in the covenant. We tend to associate that with baptism, but that's not actually the time when that takes place. That transition would occur upon receiving your baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And that is when Gentiles are officially adopted into the house of Israel. So just, that's just kind of an interesting tidbit. You know, it it's good to associate us with Israel the way that President Nelson has said that Israel represents those who let God prevail. Yes. And I think that the the culmination of letting God prevail in your life will be a baptism of fire, a purification, and up-leveling of your spirituality. Yeah, and I think that uh, that Jesus Christ actually defined it in 3 Nephi 15 because he was telling the saints there in 3 Nephi the, they in Jerusalem, when he told them that he had other sheep, they thought that was going to be the Gentile nations, the ones that they were to go out to. But he didn't. They, they didn't understand that the other sheep had to be Israelites. So mm -hmm. talking about them in America, and he actually clarifies it. He says, and they didn't understand that the Gentiles were to be be converted through their preaching, and. He goes on to say that never at any time will I speak to the Gentiles. Right. So immediately, you know, your mind goes, wait a minute, Joseph Smith, what? How does this work? And I have always told, told my students what is so beautiful and so amazing in scriptures that Jesus has defined that you are numbered as his sheep if he speaks to you and you hear. And so that's your whole adoption. That's, that's everything is, is when we hear the words of Christ, right. that we become his. And not just hear, but hearken. We hear it and then we respond in obedience. Well, and truthfully, the finale of that will be the wedding supper. In essence, when we become in the full sense of the word, his bride. We like to think we're there already, but, uh, you know, truthfully, I don't believe we are. We're betrothed. We're betrothed. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say. You talk about baptism. It's really the betrothal. It's the uh, commitment to and And the final completion is the baptism of fire. Uh, and for some of us, it might be very real. Um, <laughs> you know, but that being said, uh, it's a very beautiful thing. I don't know if you want to jump back to the timeline a little, but there's a few. Things. Yeah, let's go, let's go back. That was a fun little tangent. But I wanted to jump back and and point out that the biggest event that we probably will see in 24 from a scriptural point of view, well, there's tons of them actually, but some of them are more, less precise to interpret. Okay. Then one of them is very precise and it's the 2300 days spoken of in chapter eight of Daniel. That's the 2300 days pointing to something, you know, and I, the thing that became amazing when all this came together is all of these numbers focus in on this big event in the middle of it all at First Fruits at Adam on Diamond. And that was an amazing discovery. Meaning they, the numbers either count to, to that date or from that date. But they all center on every single number centers in on that date. And that is really significant when you consider that in Daniel 9, 27, he, he refers to the middle of that seven year period as when the big double cross takes place. And you can connect it all very thoroughly with the scriptures. Uh, and like I said before, it's hard to go through all that in a podcast, but you, you can get it in our book. You can get it in some of our presentations and you can obviously, uh, when the presentations actually, a lot of them are on uh, YouTube 
and they're almost all for free. Although we can sell you a DVD too, but and I'm not, we're not, we've never been about anything but sharing this message. Um, I wanted to clarify that that big event takes place Hanukkah 24. And it's significant that it takes place in Hanukkah 24. Where this Hanukkah of 2024? Yes. Okay. And and if you understand what Hanukkah in 2024, or particularly what Hanukkah itself is, it is the rededication of Temple Mount um, in many in Israel. And I'm not going to say that the temple is going to be rededicated then, because I, I believe that it's going to take place, that the sacrifice is going to begin then. The temple probably won't be dedicated for a while later. But that being said, um, in Ezra's day, they started the daily sacrifices, what Daniel 8 talks about as the daily sacrifice. And they can start that without the temple. They don't need the temple in Jerusalem to start that sacrifice. And in Ezra's day, they actually started the daily sacrifice in preparation why they were building the temple. So, you know, they were able to do that, fulfill that. And that's the key event, and it's it's a type and a shadow of so many things um, in historical context. I, I just wanted to tell a little bit of a fun story about that number, that 2,300 days in Daniel of, that's associated with the daily sacrifice. Um, you have to realize that when, when Gerald was doing all the mathematical equations and counting all the days in between the prophetic appointments on the calendars and everything, he basically found that midpoint and that 2031 uh, first fruits event from the numbers 1,290 and 1,260. And, and there was only one way that that could work on a calendar. But anyway, what, after he figured all that out and everything, and one day he came downstairs and we were all talking about. Um, we actually Daniels. had a group of friends. We had a group of friends. We were talking about. <clears throat> this amazing thing that we had figured out. And uh, all of a sudden, one of them said, wait a minute, Farrell, if the 1,290 works and the 1,260 works, the 2,300 has to fit in and the 1,335, they have to work too. And so, um, you know, there's like this awkward silence and, and Farrell says, yeah, I, I, I should check that out. And we all wait. <laughs> He's like, you mean you want me to go check now? Yeah, go <laughs> and, do it. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we got this. You go, you go figure this out. So about a half hour later, he comes out of his office and, and he was actually pale. And I, I immediately knew something was wrong. And I said, hey, what, what did you figure out? What did you find? And he said, from that midpoint, counting the 2,300 before and the 1,335 after, they both land on Hanukkah 10 years apart. And that just blew us away because Hanukkah isn't, yeah. isn't really one of the seven big you know, Jewish feasts. That's, that was one that was developed historically later. Right. But it is the dedication of the temple. And, and what we realized is that that would be when they would have to start the daily sacrifice in order for Daniel's prophecies to, to be fulfilled. And when we figured that out, there were no red heifers on the scene. There were, you know, none of this was, and, and now we're watching the news and guess when the red heifers, if they, if they still are valid by the time this comes around, they will, be ready to be offered in 2023 in late in 2023 and early, and early into 2024 and understand that the offering of the red heifer is not the daily offering that's a different one that's that's, that's something a that's a burnt offering that they offer every day okay but the but the red heifer has to happen before the daily offerings can happen mm. and so i mean that's what i was saying when we were at the beginning is is that's when we decided we have to we have to share this information because we're watching the prophecies happen exactly like Daniel's numbers said that they would. Right. And and that those sacrifices, just to clarify, are to be made in Israel. Old Jerusalem. Yes. Old Jerusalem. Yeah, this will be a Levitical sacrifice, not a 
Melchizedek sect. This isn't Melchizedek ordinance. This is Levitical ordinance. And right. we know by Joseph Smith that they are ready by lineage hold the authority to make those. And even Joseph Smith acknowledges that. If you have a, a Levite that can trace his lineage, he already has the right to do those sacrifices. Mm. So that is kind of a weird thought in our heads. We're not, yeah, we didn't ever come we, up with that at all if Daniel's that. numbers had no setting. You and, know? <laughs> and so you play that all out, it gets pretty fascinating, but I just watched a current, it's not a, um, a mainstream news source by any means, but it's a guy who reports a lot on Israel. And Benjamin Netanyahu um, has now starting to make statements that it's not right that the Israelites or the Jews can't go on Temple Mount and pray. It, the staging is all taking place right in front of our eyes. Right. Well, and I think they received a shipment of 10 red heifers a couple months ago, didn't they? Five yeah. So, and this statement by Benjamin Netanyahu is pretty landmark. But what has kept all this stuff from playing out? Well, obviously, God had a timeline. But the other thing that's kept it from ever happening is were they to start to do things on Temple Mount, it would most surely get responded to by a holy war. Right. We would see just Islam violently respond. Yeah, it would be challenging. And so we are actually, I believe that, and I've said that, if if you assume like I do, if let's just assume for argument's sake that these numbers are correct and that I'm not blowing smoke when I report on these numbers, you realize that something's got to happen to make it possible for the daily sacrifice to start. And that's the next thing on the horizon. Mm. It's exciting. It's exciting to look forward to. And something we should be seeing in the next less than a year and a half, which is really, yeah, really cool. Well, technically two years would be when the daily sacrifice would start. Mm -hmm. Monica is about to start actually Monday this year. Uh, our Monday coming up here. That's right. Um, so, and don't get confused. It's not, the 19th every year. It's, it moves around just like all the right. days move around. But this year, it's Hanukkah starts Monday, this coming Monday, which is really cool to know. Yeah. Exactly two years on the Hebrew calendar from there is when the daily sacrifice is to start based on Daniel's numbers. But in, in preparatory to that, a lot of things got to happen. Because if they just go start that, man, you got... The Middle East explodes. Got a, an explosion, I mean, right? You know? Yeah. So a lot's got to happen. Which, granted, it will, but... Yeah. Something's going to happen up until soon. Right. Really, really interesting. So let's go back. I want to spend just a little bit more time on 2024 to 2027. And, like, what are some of the preparations? What are some of the labor pains of Rachel that perhaps we as covenant people of the Lord should be aware of? Now, this is quite conjecture in nature, but um, just understand that based on a multiple of converging scripture and much of Ezra Ziegel that people have talked about, there is so many events lining up for 2024. I mean, if you realize in Ezra Ziegel, for instance, and if you give any stock to Ezra Ziegel, um, don't get me wrong. You got multiple people interpreting Ezra's eagle differently. Yeah, let take a step back. Can you explain what Ezra's eagle is? What you're referring to when you say that? In Ezra's eagle is a prophecy in the apocrypha uh, of Ezra, which is a book that the Ezra of the Bible actually wrote to. He also wrote it. It just isn't as um, canonized because of it hadn't gone through all the. Um, scrutiny that the rest of the books of the Bible went through. Refer to DNC 91. It yeah. needs to be read with the Spirit of God, right? Okay. okay. Yes. Joseph Smith actually said that there was, that the Apocrypha was quite correct and that he was not impressed to translate it. Yes. And right. actually in his Bible, the Apocrypha was included and then it was disincluded in later versions of the Bible. So something to consider. Anyway, continue. So in that 
in that book of Ezra's, Esdras, they actually say it quite a little bit different, but same Ezra as in the Bible that built the the temple, or actually he went to assist in the final build, completion of the temple in uh, after they were in Babylon, the captivity. That same Ezra gives this prophetic picture. He's also the one that says that the... Uh, the seven years would be the last tribulation of the of the times. He, he said it would be a week of years. A week of years. In the, in the book of Ezra as well. But that being said, you, if you realize that the way the layout of the eagle feathers, if you want to call them feathers in one translation, wings in another one, it's just different. Different translators have did it slightly different from the original. But in that book, it refers to the fact that we're on the last feather before the eagle heads wake up okay right now we're already there so the next two feathers according to the book of Esdras, get eaten up which means the next two presidents get eaten they get taken out right so the interpretation of the feathers and you can find more extensive information on why this is the way that it is, but I'm, pr- I'm pretty convinced that this is a true interpretation because there's very few other ways once you dig into the details that it could be interpreted. But the feathers are representative of presidents of the United States. And then the eagle heads, what do the eagle heads represent? Well, that's where there's a lot of people interpreting it differently. I'm not going to do anything but give you my particular interpretation is that these eagle heads are part of the New World Order organization. Now, there is one interpretation that they're the political parties. League uh, of Foreign an, Nations at the beginning. Yeah. Right. Anyway, and there's another interpretation that the, the eagle heads are um, three branches of government that we have. Personally, I don't see those tr- interpretations making any sense to me. I believe they are three leaders that come to play part of the ten horns, okay, that are referred to in Revelation. The three of them are three of those horns um, that play out in the end time scenario and that the Antichrist, most probable, is the one that takes out those three horns uh, by Mm -hmm. the book of Revelation. That's my personal perspective. Okay, that they're part of this the ten horns that govern with the beast for one week of seven, for one hour actually is the way it's referred to in the book of Revelation, that they rule with the beast for one hour. I agree with that too, just based on my interpretation and my study. I feel like they are three leaders of the ten that are prophesied to be ten globalist personas is kind of how I've interpreted. And that they proceed the rise of the Antichrist. And this is really, really important to understand, actually, because the the globalist people are, are not good people. Like, these are bad guys. The Antichrist is uh, obviously also, he's the bad guy yeah. in all of history and time. But one of the reasons that he is the Antichrist and he assumes a savior kind of perspective, people view him as a savior is because he subdues this other bad guy. And, you know, with us and our TV and our movies, we, we love a good guy and a bad guy in, in every conflict. And in the last days, there's not a good guy, bad guy conflict. It's going to be all bad guys <laughs> a lot of the time. So this is really important to understand is that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to do it in such a way that makes him look good. Like maybe this is the Christ. Maybe this is a savior for our people because he's taking out this organization that is horrible and and terrible to us. Um, So it's really important to look for whoever's the first quote unquote good guy on the scene is not going to be the one that we should be looking for. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I wanted to go back really quickly to the, to the feathers three and four on the Eagle that are our next two presidents that are eaten up in the prophecy. Because if you cross reference eaten up through scripture, um, it, it leads you directly to Isaiah five, where the the walls of the vineyard are broken down; they, they they're eaten up, and then it always refers first to war. 
okay, and resources being eaten up. And and this is going to lead us directly back to, so what's going on in 2024 to 2027? I mean, we've got feathers getting eaten up, and which is symbolically war in scriptures. And, and then you also have um, a statement by David Whitmer when he was interviewed by Joseph F. Smith and Orson Pratt, and it was published in, in the newspaper um, back in 1873, I think it was. Anyway, 83. Anyway, it was, a, it was after the Civil War. But what David Whitmer says is he says that Joseph Smith told them that there would be a civil war and that after that civil war, the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon would come forth. And so that, it's, it's a really fun prophecy, right? Thank you for bringing that up. I wanted to go there because, yes. So a, a couple of points to clarify. The next two feathers after this, after President Biden, he represents the feather that we're currently on. They're not actually official presidents. In the scriptures, it says these are two who would think to rule. Right. So two personas who would like to assume the leadership of the country. And a lot of people have interpreted that different ways. There's some people that think of the line of succession and say, okay, so that would be the vice president and then the speaker of the house. Um, and that's a really popular prevailing opinion. But for myself personally, this is the doctrine according to Megan, you guys like don't take this very seriously. <laughs> but um, for myself personally, because I know this prophecy um, that Joseph Smith prophesied that there would be a second civil war in the United States. He prophesied that it would begin in Chicago, which he said at the moment is a very small town, but by the time this happens, it will become a great city. And he said that it would commence as a result of the depreciation of the currency or really rapid inflation is the other way to say that. And so when I, having known that prophecy, the way that I see those two feathers is not necessarily in the line of secession, but is instead perhaps two leaders of the two factions that will make up, that will constitute the beginning of this civil war. And, uh, and to be clear, like, I don't think that this will be a civil war in the same way that it was in the 1860s. I don't think it's going to be a North versus South. Uh, I think that it's going to be more of what prophecy in the scriptures describe as every man for himself, family against family, brother against brother, father against son, like, it, it will be much more divisive uh, and there won't really be clear sides to the issue. But anyway, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Rhonda. And I got to share my, my two cents that don't matter. And I've never heard anyone say it before, but it's, it's just my thoughts that I've had. I actually enjoyed your perspective. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I kind of view it that there's, they have to, in order for the, basically the new world order or whatever you want to call it, secret combinations, whatever, um, in order for them to establish authority, they have to take down the the law of order and rule. It has to become chaotic. And so then you can have the new world order to the rescue is basically mm -hmm. the way we kind of see this period so, going down. Right. I'll just play it out. Kind of a conjectured approach of the way I see this landing. Okay. In order for the daily sacrifice to start in Israel, the biggest thing holding Israel back right now is us and the United Nations. Okay. Meaning that, the, and it's mostly us, meaning America. They don't really care that much about the United Nations. They care about our alliance, America, mm -hmm. their big brother, so to speak, as they've been established in all this. So they don't want to cross us really. But what would keep them so that they don't care anymore? Well, I'll tell you what it would be. It would be that America has lost its world standing. And if America loses its world standing by a civil war, then all of a sudden, not only is Israel free to act, but so is Islam. And I think we're going to see us go into civil war and then Islam is going to see a window of opportunity. Israel's going to do what they did in the Six Day War. They have great intelligence. They're going to hit them hard. And according, and I just did a presentation on this um, in the last several weeks. From Ezekiel 35. From Ezekiel 35, 36. 
and 38, and then 38 and 39, and it's two different battles in the Holy Land. And this first battle, Israel is going to win decisively. Um, they're going to actually take out the threat of their local neighbors. According, mm-hmm. according Ezekiel to 35. Ezekiel 35 and 36 and Psalms 83's battle, they're going to take out their immediate neighbors. And in their taking out of these immediate neighbors, it's going to create a lot of chaos in the world on one side. And there's going to be a lot of contention. People are not going to be happy about that. But the difference is, is Big Brother's kind of off the stage. When I, and I'm not referring to 1984, the book. I'm referring to us. They'll, they'll be on the stage. <laughs> yeah. That Big Brother will be on the stage. Yeah. I'm referring to Israel's kind of Big Brother has been America. Yes. America's influence is about to dwindle on the world stage in a massive way. That doesn't mean all of our arsenal is going to diminish. Our arsenal is going to become the arsenal of the Ten Horns. But as an influential government on the world scene, America's going to be out of play. And it's going to be out of play because of this civil war we're talking about. We are going to become too occupied with our own problems to even have any influence on a world stage. So it's going to leave a vacuum on the world stage. And that world stage vacuum is going to be filled by Israel to a degree, believe it or not, on the good guy side. And on the bad guy side, you're going to see the ten horns. And as that plays out, that is going to provide the environment for this ultimate bad guy to do the treaty spoken of in Daniel 9.27. And he's going to do that in 2027 because of the chaos the world is in Mm. okay the world is going to be in chaos so much between 24 and 27 that this guy is going to come to power by this peace treaty he's going to propose of a of the seven-year treaty that's spoken of in daniel 9 27 that he double crosses in the middle very clear in scripture how this all plays out Mm -hmm. and he is going to provide the deal that everybody's going to love and he's going to actually Israel's going to sign on and we are not. Why would Israel sign on to this deal unless not? Well, the answer, I love what Rhonda actually penned that very, very accurately because they don't believe in the book of revelation Mm. and because they don't believe in the book of revelation, they only believe in the old Testament. They don't believe in the beast, the mark of the beast. Right. And so they'll just think this peace treaty is the best thing ever. But and the reason why we Christians do not buy into that is because we have the book of Revelation. And we know this new world order empire is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. But that's also going to villainize Christians. Absolutely. So then you have your first Nephi 13 and 14 where it says, that they are going to start, a, there's going to be the church of the Lamb of God, Christians that believe in the atonement of Christ, and you're going to have the church of the other one. And you'll have to choose which one you're going to belong to. And, and the Christians are going to get persecuted. Mm-hmm. And actually, during that period of time, Israel's going to experience a real blossoming from 27 to 31. They're actually going to experience. Um, a big gathering, which is Ezekiel 37, between the two wars. They're going to have the initial war that they take out their their close proximity neighbors, and they become more secure, especially when the treaty comes into play. And they're going to operate under this treaty for three and a half years, where they're going to have a great gathering of the of the Jews, even in a bigger way than they've ever had. And that's going to be kind of a next layer fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, which is the dry bones being resurrected conceptually two ways, but mostly it's the regathering of the nation of Israel in a big way because the rest of the earth is in a lot of turmoil up until that time. But if you understand because of modern revelation, we know that that same period of time, that silence in the heavens is our persecution time Mm. Christians because and it says it very clearly in Daniel 7 
that uh, we're persecuted in a big way until Michael stands. And if you can read it very clearly in, in Daniel 7, uh, we're, we're delivered at Adam on Diamond. Mm -hmm. And we get delivered from our tribulation. Right. Well, that's when the, the child, the kingdom of God, is born. And the, ter the total changing events happens right there at that transitional time. But unfortunately, that leaves us with about um, seven years of trouble. First civil war and anarchy, and then massive persecution by the New World Order that has come together on a coalition with the Antichrist. The final fulfillment of the White Horse and the covenant he makes with Israel to have this peace treaty for seven years. And starting in 27, and he will double cross the deal in 31 at this Red Sea event, which really changes the whole nature and establishes um, the New Jerusalem. As a place of safety. And Absolutely, in a thought, big right? way. I'm going to take a stab at what the event is. Go ahead. Because I was going to ask, but I'm pretty sure. So my my guess is that this this pivotal event, this changing of the tides that we're talking about, is going to be the return of the Lost Ten Tribes. I would say that that's there, yes. But okay. you do realize that the person who's going to orchestrate this event is the Antichrist on the enemy side. And if you read in the last few verses of Daniel 11, you realize that's when he does the same thing that Antiochus Epiphanes did as a type of the past. And he declares himself God, and he does it in the Holy of Holies. In the Old Jerusalem. Old Jerusalem, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did. And in response to that arrogant play by the Antichrist, Michael stands and says, enough. We're going to turn this thing around. And we have this political event that takes place on the two sides of the globe. You have Judah going into the worst years of tribulation it's ever known, which is Gog Magog play one. Mm -hmm. This Gog Magog play out that goes into Jerusalem. But at the same time, we have just been delivered and the new Jerusalem you remember we talked about opposites. Mm -hmm. We have the worst thing at going on on the old world, and we have the greatest of things going on in the new world. The establishment of the new Jerusalem and the covenant and the 144,000 are busy in rescue missions, and they've all been called, and they're sent out on their missions. And we have a really beautiful time going on in this hemisphere by that time. I want to draw that parallel, though, to, to the time of Christ, because we, we've already said that Daniel's numbers center in on first fruits there. Well, first fruits at the time of Christ was his resurrection, right? And then 50 days later, that's when the apostles went out to the nations on their missions. That's when they went Pentecost. out. So here at Adam on Naaman, you've got this first fruits event, and it's a resurrection in DNC 88, just like it was at the time of Christ and Daniel 12, 2. And then and then you have this 50 day interval, and, and you have the 144,000 going out on their missions in the exact same way that the disciples went out on their missions after the resurrection of Christ. It, it, it's all in types and shadows, and it's all pointing to the prophetic, the prophetic appointments. Hmm. And so you can see that the types and shadows of the past are absolutely playing out in repeat in a beautiful way that you're seeing at this event, these 144,000 get called, and they have to be, endowed with power to go out as hundreds of men because this spoken is the, of in the, the worst time the earth's ever yeah, seen it's the worst time mm -hmm. because well play it out the half hour of silence just played out in dnc 88 and that, let me address that for just a second um, a lot of people believe there's two half hours of silence i don't sign on to that at all it's the same half hour of silence two outcomes okay mm -hmm. there's the outcome for the saints and the outcome for the rest of the world 
The outcome for the saints is written very clearly in DNC 88. The outcome for the rest of the world is in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. In the book of Revelation, the saints side of it too, but it's not as clear as it is in DNC 88. And for those that aren't familiar with the Revelation outcome is judgment and the DNC 88 outcome, it says immediately after the half hour of silence, the heavens unroll as a scroll and the face of the Lord is unveiled and there's so, a resurrection. Yeah, and so the new Jerusalem goes through a, what I like to equate as a dimensional shift, just for sake of a way to explain it. And we, we actually go into a terrestrial glory first, mm -hmm. the new Jerusalem, and yet the windows open so they can still see us. Right. But to them, Zion is terrible. They, they're afraid of it because they don't understand it. They're looking at something that's incomprehensible to them. Right. The kind of glory um, is, you know, covering the New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the outcome for the saints. The outcome for the rest of the world is the judgments of Revelation. Those judgments of Revelation, if you've ever read them, they're really, really intense. So the world is going through the worst times it's ever known. The rest of the world is going through the worst times it's ever known. And, and, and New Jerusalem is the most glorious times. So you've got that opposition again that we talked about. Okay. Right. And it's a beautiful scenario on the one side. But what's going on in the rest of the world is they start to starve to death. And this is actually the excuse the Antichrist uses to break the deal. The treaty he makes with Israel, he breaks the deal in the middle because of the trouble that's in the earth. The conditions he created. Yeah, he's created all these conditions and he breaks the treaty because Israel's the only one still eating. Mm -hmm. Because they have developed their gathering and they're very productive and they're desert. I don't know if you've looked at it. Israel's leading the world in agricultural technology mm. right now. They're the becoming the new breadbasket and they're in the middle of a desert mm -hmm. and they're but they're becoming this absolute high-tech farming situation where uh, they are feeding 10 times their population right and that's just incredible so that playing out this all plays out in such a way that we're in the worst of times for them and the best of times for in us. the best of times yeah that's awesome. I want to kind of transition here and draw this to conclusion. Obviously, there's so many places we could go. There's so much more we could talk about, so much detail to get into. But I'd like to close with a, a little bit more of an explanation of how to be the victorious saints in this in this situation. Because again, as we've talked about, it's not as simple as just being a member of the church. It's not even just as simple as enduring tribulation, right? Like our tribulation has to mean something. It has to change something. Um, and Rhonda, maybe this would be a good, a good topic for you to talk about, but I'd like to talk a little bit about Isaiah's analogies of labor and that there are five different groups and each of them is experiencing a different length and intensity of labor and and what do those things signify would you mind kind of overviewing that yeah i'd be glad to um so the different labors are the lord himself and if you imagine that these labors this the child is going to be born adam on diamond the new jerusalem is going to be born as a result of these labors so it says that when the Lord himself in Isaiah goes into labor, he goes forth as a warrior and protects his people. And so just imagine that happening at the New Jerusalem. Now it says that Zion, when she goes into labor, there's actually two verses there. And it's really interesting because in the one verse, it says that before she goes into labor, a child is born, the son is born. And so this would be the, the coming of your John the Baptist type person that's going to help everybody prepare for this labor and, and, and this earth that has to happen. And, but then it says that when she goes into labor, in another place it says, when Zion goes into labor, she delivers her children. So this is the deliverance of Zion there. And, and it's all, all these labors are focusing in on the same point that Daniel's numbers focus in on. And so the other one that goes into labor is the earth. 
And it's fascinating because in Isaiah, storm imagery, like hail and fire and and it, the wind, this is all imagery of the Antichrist figure, okay? And so that you have to know that to understand what the earth says when she goes into labor. She says, we thought we were bringing forth peace, but what we brought forth was the wind. Mm. That's what she says. And remember that at that reversal point, that's when he sits in the temple and declares himself to be God, according to Isaiah 14. Anyway, then um, the other one is Babylon. And when Babylon goes into labor, it says that all of her children die. So this is the fall of Babylon. And, uh, you know, we talked about um, the 10 tribes being part of this Adam on Diamond event. But also what we haven't talked about is the fact that this Antichrist figure, when he sits in the temple, he has to do some sort of a, a coordinated attack to take out three horns and to establish himself. And of course, in scripture, in Joel 2 and all over, it, it's fire. It's mushrooming clouds of smoke. And, and we all know that this is some sort of a, an unleashing of nuclear weapons. In Daniel 11, it's he forecasts devices, you know. And um, so at this big, huge event when he establishes himself he collapses the the western babylon financial system completely and of course that's what gives rise to the antichrist and, and the mark of the beast and all of that be quick that that in the revelation that system we're talking about is babylon the whore that's riding the beast meaning it's not it's not this beastly government it's this whore riding the beast which is the finance, which is the, the money. really it's the west corrupt new form of government that gets eaten by the little horn in essence he takes it out so again it's the wicked taking out the wicked that we talked about earlier but i love the fact that the, that the zion's children are born here you have the opposite things happening but but your first question was so what do we do how do we be righteous saints and and one of the most beautiful things i ever heard was um that i know where you should be in order to be safe and uh, mm. and i'm like okay i'm all ears where, where do you need to be to be safe and uh, and he said in the palm of jesus's hand mm -hmm need to be in the well, hand of God and that your mission is going to look different than anybody else's. It's I, all about your relationship with Christ. I think you missed one of the lines where he says, oh, what did you say? where he says, you need the safest place you can be is doing exactly what God would have you do. Mm -hmm. That only safe place we can be is doing and living. And it's going to have to become very, very personal. You're going to have to have a personal connection with your Savior, a personal connection with the heavens and with revelation that you know what to be doing. Because if this scenario was correct, that we're in civil war and that all of the modern conveniences we now enjoy and communication is not readily available, you're not going to be able to run to anybody. To get in, you're going to have to be capable of getting answers. And that's the safest place to be is in the spirit. Well, Christ says the spirit, the scriptures say, which would be Christ saying it, <laughs> that the spirit or the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, meaning you will understand what's happening, the closer relationship you can develop with your savior so that you can have that communication direct because that's what it's going to require. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to run to your file leader very easily. If communication is down, you're going to have to be able to get direction for you and your family. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that imagery. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that you can connect those two and say that if you are, striving for perfect obedience to the personal revelation, to the voice of the spirit that speaks to you, 
that is you giving yourselves into the hands of the Lord. Yes. Absolutely. Because that is that is the only way that he can really shape us because he he respects our agency so much. And unless we submit in totality, his hands are figuratively tied because we tied them. Um, and so I really love that idea of untying the hands of the Lord by practicing perfect obedience to every word that he gives you. And, and we know that that is, that is the key to not just surviving, but thriving and being partakers of the glorious equal and opposite reaction to all these things that we've talked about today. What a beautiful testimony. Thank you guys so much. This was so enlightening. This is completely unique to, you know, compared to the other podcasts that we've done. But again, I felt really impressed that this was something that we need to share, that there's an urgency. Um, and I know that you guys feel the same way. For our listeners, I hope that, you know, we went we went through a lot. We went through a lot <laughs> today. There are many, many different ways that you can choose and and hopefully you'll be guided in how you choose to pursue studying any of these topics, if, if you feel impressed to. Um, but again, above all else, just my my highest recommendation and, and the testimony that I've gained, I know Farrell and Rhonda, you could echo this as well, is that the best thing that you can do is to prepare yourself spiritually. And, and what that means is climbing the spiritual ladder, walking the covenant path, uh, obtaining the spiritual blessings that come from s- full submission to the Lord, uh, until the point where we are truly in his hands, where we can see him and, and commune with him face to face and have that guidance that we need. Uh, so I just want to end with that little testimony. But thank you guys again so much. This was so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't mind just concluding with this on our side. And that is, this is the testimony we give of him that he lives. And we absolutely need to find ourselves in that trust. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.